after the introduction uh, as i have observed your uh, professional work a uh, little and as we discuss uh, about kubernetes and all those uh, stuff on this lecture as well so i have a impression that you are also uh, working closely with some open source projects and creating issues and uh, giving out pr so uh, let let we uh, let us tell uh, the audience about what are the open source projects and what is uh, actually the cncf organization what uh, what they are doing in this field okay so actually you know uh, uh, cncf uh, is more about the cloud and native side mm -hmm. now you know this this you know part might can stretch a little bit because you know if you talk about the cncf uh, mm -hmm. uh, the cloud native part and everything if you see the previous time uh, we are continuously evolving so mm -hmm. the, previously because the full monolithic system people were try to deploy in into the physical server mm -hmm. they were following the waterfall model for you know development process and everything mm -hmm. then they used to do it to physical server so data center they host their application mm -hmm. fully monolithic and everything then we evolve mm -hmm. then we you know move to the agile method mm -hmm. and then we are continuously following the agile method and a, a evolution comes from the physical we are started using the vm servers mm -hmm. uh, then from from you know vms uh, we again evolve a little bit and the uh, you know containers and microservices come into the picture so the microservices and container who don't have idea it mm -hmm. is more about you know creating the small piece and you are running managing it and everything so the devops comes into the picture right. for the develop process Mm -hmm. so the microservices devops uh, containers uh, then you know cloud also co comes into the picture same time so mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, cloud native is more about the you know you know software development uh, organizations organizations can you easily build deploy and manage that application or software into the cloud so it was about the cloud native side but uh, you know while we talk about the Uh, foundation the mm -hmm. organization itself uh, cloud native the foundation organization mm -hmm. there you know what try to do is uh, there you know bring up the people mm -hmm. so uh, from the different uh, uh, organizations or from the um, market or you know uh, it is kind of they are managing the project so okay. for example uh, uh, when this containers comes into the picture mm -hmm. the management of container also the one task it is the big task all you have the tons of container to manage so okay. at that time google you know everyone might have heard about kubernetes and google gave that project to the cncf okay. and then cncf started managing that specific project mm -hmm. so you know it is more like cncf manage that specific project mm -hmm. and it is more about you know uh giving a uh, better software for a better you know kind of i can say application or mm -hmm. that's specific thing to the end customer mm -hmm. so you know it is always a collective way that a cnc of specifically focus mm -hmm. and also the open source things uh, if you see the kubernetes then uh, i have seen the uh, team from red hat team from amazon team from google mm -hmm. and also the other developer and folks from the open source Mm -hmm. they are all actively contributing to kubernetes right so cncf mostly focus about the collective power and mm -hmm. they manage so uh, you know all the competitors aws google uh, oracle and all are if you see are the competitors into the cloud market everyone mm -hmm. is offering the uh, you know kubernetes service right but the, you know cncf bring them onto the one specific platform and all can collectively mm -hmm. move ahead and right. all can you know, got collectively uh, resolve the issue for for the end users or end customers mm -hmm. if i i am using the specific service with mm -hmm. any of specific cloud provider which is not supported by the cncf mm -hmm. uh, it is not open source then what will happen some day if uh, that specific company decide we want to stop this service right. then what will happen <laughs> i will be gone. right i could be gone like it would be hard for my organization or my company or my team to uh, run the uh, specific things because mm -hmm. now that service is down right. while what will happen if that project is supported by the cncf it is open source so i can at least uh, you know try to run or try to set up on my end if that company stop ser serving or you know mm -hmm. uh, 
provide the support for that and oh, even if the, it is part of cncl then it might could happen the oh, you know more than one company is providing the support for right. the service mm-hmm. specific thing so you know that is the main task of cncl mm-hmm. uh, organization they try to you know uh, uh, suggest the best practices uh, try to suggest the you know development process and they create the event mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, recently i think in maybe april or may the kubcon in uh, europe is there yeah. so they you know give the idea they talk about the technology best practices and everything that mm-hmm. you know it can help the end user so it was about the mm-hmm. uh, cnc and also the one thing in cnc for two two part of project are there mm-hmm. so one is the graduate project the another one is the uh, incubating project also okay. the sandbox sandbox project are there mm-hmm. but, uh, we i just want to talk generally about this too mm-hmm. so this project is is the part of a graduate uh, graduate project so mm-hmm. it is like all you doing well it is graduate stable and everything okay uh, fluent is also the part of same things and also um, um many other projects mm-hmm. on the on the incubating side uh, i think geta is there the sto so service mesh also one of my favorite project that is also the part of this incubator project so mm-hmm. all those this project you know managed by cnc uh, all the people collectively do the you know uh, open source works to this project they contribute and mm-hmm. those this project get evolved with the time so mm-hmm. that's all mostly about the cnc and what they do okay uh also like uh, uh, i was wondering about this particular thing that uh, why uh, corporate uh, create a project and then they donate this project to open source community uh, like cncf but uh, after your answer i got a clarity mm-hmm. that if you are building something that is bigger than your organization like you are doing a concept level uh, uh, development then it will take like a long uh, span of time for the uh, developers and you will need a larger team to uh, work around it to decide the best practices and i think uh, donating a project to uh, organization like cncf is the best thing to uh, move uh, move that concept like the uh, project i had like uh, like kubernetes so yeah that much thing so yeah. yeah that was a really a good insight about i i only just heard about the cncf because uh, i i have just read somewhere on the internet that uh, kubernetes is the number one project on cncf and then there is on the second number there is this open telemetry collector uh, which uh, i am working uh, recently so i just heard the name cncf uh, twice or thrice uh, here and there but i wanted to get a clarity about it and yeah your answer was really helpful there so uh, so uh, cncf project have like uh, like 100 of uh, open source projects like and uh, the kubernetes is the most popular among them so Uh, another question i had is uh, do corporates uh, like allow their uh, employees to contribute uh, uh, on this uh, open source project because it will uh, like uh, your uh, good amount of time will be invested in uh, those kind of contribution so are co- corporates concerned about uh, that uh, you should contribute less and leverage more out of it so how, how this things work uh yeah so my, you know uh as i mentioned uh, there is the team from reddit or i have at least seen i'm not sure about the, mm-hmm. that specific team is always doing the contribution to kubernetes but i have leveraged the fox mm-hmm. from the reddit amazon google and they are you know impressively regularly contributing and supporting these things mm-hmm. now i'm not sure about the different uh, you know uh, organizations policy what they have policy like uh, you know do uh, do they have uh, you know specific requirement like out of uh, three days two days or specific mm-hmm. hour you might be contributing to these specific things i'm not sure about the mm-hmm. uh, you know at that hour so the specific policy okay. but uh, mostly what i have seen is even if it is you know into the policy side uh, organization are a little bit flexible what i guess uh, based on seeing their time their contribution and everything and you know people are so much uh, uh, you know how the enthusiasm mm-hmm. to contribute to that specific thing so even i'm i'm sitting going to saturday sunday and i'm contributing to stack or writing the people's answer solving the issues or everything if mm-hmm. anything required or github i'm i'm also contributing to that 
Okay. So it is more about you know people's choice. Uh, policy, I'm not seeing any specific organization. Mike could be uh, suggesting to their employee like you do not have permission to do the open source post. Mm -hmm. right. so, you know, it is a kind of you know people spare the time out of their busy schedule mm -hmm. or maybe on Saturday Sunday they do right. something. So as of now, I have not come across any specific policy that you know don't give permission right. to employee. It, it could be there. I, I don't know about the, those, you know, organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, so it's yeah, it like it's... organization to organization. How, how yeah, so... they are and how much time they have uh, in uh, their day-to-day the, the -day schedule to do it. But yes, generally, also... no one like uh, restricts you from doing that. Yes, yes, yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, absolutely. Also, I have seen uh, some mm -hmm. of the organizations even, you know, push you to mm -hmm. go a little bit hard, um, you know, a little bit ahead and do the contribution. So definitely it's changed organization to organization. Yeah, because they know that it's like a win-win situation. If you contribute more, you will get more out of it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Good. Okay, so we covered about the CNCF, we or the open source project. Let, uh, let us uh, discuss more about uh, like uh, Kubernetes and your work around Kubernetes and your experience because uh, whenever I reach out to Harsh, it is mostly regarding the uh, Kubernetes observability because currently the project which I'm working on, uh, it is uh, an infrastructure monitoring uh, project. So we also monitor like a plain OS like Linux and Windows as well. But uh, as uh, Kubernetes is like a uh, trending uh, infrastructure these days, so we are also observing that. And I have a few questions around it. But first of all, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, b before this uh, interview, we had a discussion that you are doing some contribution, that you are uh, translating the documentation of Kubernetes in this, into Gujarati. So tell us more about it. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, recently the K Kubernetes plan to, you know, change their m m main website, which is kubernetes.io. So they plan to translate into the local languages. Right. So uh, I think, uh, you know, if uh, local language have the uh, general, I don't exactly remember that uh, it's a small name, but mm -hmm. uh, for Hindi, it is the HN, uh, mm -hmm. officially uh, listed into the Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So Kubernetes started this these things. If your language is uh, local and it is already mentioned into that documentation somewhere, I don't have that link specific, mm -hmm. but the Hindi, translation for the Kubernetes site is done yeah. uh, for the Kubernetes.io. So mm -hmm. if you go to Kubernetes.io and you go to top of a uh, 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 right corner, mm -hmm. you have the drop down to select the language. Mm -hmm. And after that, the whole site will be tra tra translated into the Hindi. Mm -hmm. So if uh, someone is not good with uh, uh, English, they can also change to Hindi. And after that, you know, showing uh, the all across the India people joined and completed for the Hindi, then I thought, why not start for Gujarati? So I checked that list and yeah. luckily the GU was there, okay. the Gujarati. So I, I started translating those, uh, you know, page. I, you know, created the issue, created the PR for the same. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the still, I think it is uh, into the progress only few mm -hmm. page still need, need to be translated. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, once it will be done, then also from the right corner, people can read the whole site into the Gujarati. Yeah. Now, people, you know, might be having the idea or, you know, someone might suggest why, you know, you cannot do the Google Translate because mm -hmm. now you can do the right click and the whole site will be translated into the Gujarati. Right. So someone just uh, sent me the link when I, you know, put this idea into the group. Mm -hmm. uh, he was like, why we need to do the translation? Mm -hmm. uh, when Google Translate always is there, it, it can do the translate the whole website for you. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest that there is also some things called the SEO and everything. Right. So uh, Google Translate will do the only translation from in, uh, English to Hindi or English to Gujarati. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you search for the SEO and all those things, then I don't think the Gujarati anywhere coming into those things. Right. Because uh, if someone is searching into the Google in Gujarati, the Kubernetes, then I don't think, uh, you know, it will, it right. will no. come. I'm not sure. I have never tried it. But mm -hmm. ideally, that's how I think SEO works. Right. So the, you know, they, they call it content, uh, localization. Okay. Yeah. So it is also the necessary. So people are 
uh, i have seen uh, people are translating the bengali also i think uh, bengali is there the hindi is mostly done so it is available i think already into yes. the ga uh, general availability mm -hmm. the gujarati is into the beta so i'm just working and managing it so uh, maybe it, Yeah, uh, fifteen or twenty pages still remaining to translate. So, if anyone is interested, uh, anyone is watching this video, you Feel know, to to to, I will I will just suggest how to do the contribution. And officially, after that, your contribution will be directed to the Kubernetes project. Right. Yeah. So you can also have like a sense of achievement that I did some something in the uh, most popular project of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, that definitely. So that. that is the thing so you, you know it's more like giving the opportunity to gujarati people from the community they can uh, translate and contribute to the best project that they are passionate about they are working on it and all those things yeah yeah i was just curious about this thing so i was just uh, running some numbers on the internet that how many people in the world speak gujarati and so it says like more than 7 crore people across world so now uh, not all of them are developers i i I see that, but uh, like uh, you, uh, thousands and lakhs of uh, people will get more access, uh, more local access to the information on the Kubernetes side. So that's uh, really good. And uh, I will uh, like uh, add a link in the description for some for someone who want to contribute and jo join this group. So that was very good. Okay, so now I have a few more questions around Kubernetes. I am going on them one by one. So the first question is uh, that. Uh, like there is a hype about the kubernetes that every new organization that comes up uh, with a product then they first decide that i want to go uh, deploy my project into the kubernetes but recently uh, i discussed with uh, one of our uh, company client and they were like uh, we have started our company recently and we don't think that right now it is suitable for our product to uh, handle that much complexity and we do not have a staff to maintain uh, kubernetes Uh, on our structure, and if something, some one thing goes down, then, and if the cluster goes down, then uh, you cannot like uh, doing uh, do some patches like you do in the uh, plain, uh, plain setup. So, uh, what are your uh, views about that? That when when is your project ready to uh, deploy on Kubernetes, and when you should choose to uh, deploy it on Kubernetes? uh actually my specific view you know uh, it little bit different about that i don't have you know specific time when you can move to kubernetes because mm -hmm. it more you know depends and change uh, project wise project okay. project company's requirement uh, what all kind of stuff they have the skill set and everything mm -hmm. you know a developer might be having because if company is small then developer might be managing everything Right. they might be you know handling the kubernetes and everything mm -hmm. but what i have seen is kubernetes comes with a little bit complexity right uh, so it can also give you the benefit mm -hmm. so it is the both things it is more like a two side of coins it's a trade off complex yeah. so there the benefits is also that it can definitely you know uh, uh, speed up your process of the development Mm -hmm. uh if you will be managing everything into the vm and uh, then it's more like you know my own project is still, still stuck in the migration mm -hmm. and i i'm planning to migrate that specific project from last one month and still i don't have time to migrate so it is very tedious things mm -hmm. you do the clone of code you start the stuff and everything well with kubernetes it is easy if mm -hmm. you want to migrate to another cloud provider at least it will be the you know uh, work of few hours only mm -hmm. so it gives you with the benefit also but the complexity is also there if the big application or big project is that mm -hmm. if it is a small project then uh, you can create the container and you can now also have the options without running the kubernetes so the serverless containers are also there you can okay. go with a cloud run from the gcp the okay. uh, ecs is also there from the aws right. so you can create your container and you can directly run if you don't have the option or don't have the team specifically to manage the kubernetes Mm -hmm. so um, at least you have now alternative options mm -hmm. uh, you know um, it is a uh, complexity is always there but still it's um, you know depends on project level so i don't think there is any specific things like if you have the 5 6 microservices then ideally you should be moving to kubernetes so it's not like that but yeah definitely you have the option i would also suggest mm -hmm. uh, checking out the gke autopilot so, okay So if you have a team to manage, you mm -hmm. can also check out the GKE Autopilot. It is also the good things. Right. And uh, also, I would like to mention 
uh, what I recently accomplished, if you create the one cluster, mm -hmm. uh, Kubernetes cluster to any of the cloud provider, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I would suggest you to check one thing, mm -hmm. create the node and check for the capacity. If you are creating the node, suppose of say for four CPU mm -hmm. and the 16 GB of memory, I would recommend you to check how much you can actually use with Kubernetes. Okay. So go into the node. If you have the idea, just do the CopCTL describe nodes okay. and check. I think out of the two core CPU, you will be able to use only one or maybe okay. less than one. So mm -hmm. it's more like company will hit the billing. If mm -hmm. small company is trying to move to Kubernetes, they create the two core requirement, but out of two core, they will be able to only use, uh, you know, uh, half of that only or more than half. Okay. So definitely it will hit them the billing hard, very hard. So mm -hmm. this cloud run and autopilot might could save them, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, uh, it's better to... <laughs> yeah. So, so, like, what happens to the other one core CPU? Do they use for the management, or do they do not use it at all? Yeah. So, actually, the, uh, what I think is uh, they definitely use for the management because uh, inside Kubernetes, uh, you know, worker nodes and everything, they run these uh, processes. The system yeah. processes are there. The SSH process is there. Kubernetes yeah. from the Kubernetes side processes there. So, right. those specific one core CPU used by uh, those yeah. processes. Yeah, because cloud uh, if, platforms like give out uh, many more services uh, for uh, Kubernetes uh, alongside yes, the regular Kubernetes. So they need some CPU for themselves as well. But uh, this is like an uh, important thing that how much they, uh, they are using uh, from your infrastructure, but they are billing you. So you yeah. should like be aware about that. Yeah, so, so yeah. that's the main thing. If it's a small company, then definitely it will hit them hard. So this is the one thing I was also, you know, keep, uh, in mind for everyone okay. uh, whenever you are planning to move into Kubernetes because you will be having the half capacity of your plant. Okay, so I, I will also check. I have used some cloud platforms and I will check that if they are giving me the right value to my money or not. Yeah, okay. I also I would uh, suggest checking out once OPE, the okay. Oracle Kubernetes engine. And I would also like to doing the same thing and do the comparison between the Google one, the OKE and the AWS one. I, I would suggest right. to check all three. Yeah, sure. Okay, so that was some amazing insight from Harsh. Uh, next, I would like to know that there is something called OpenShift from IBM. So do we know something about that? Because I am a little confused that if they are using Kubernetes inside them only, is it a Kubernetes service or it is a, like a competitor of Kubernetes itself? Uh, basically, I have not explored, you know, being honest, I have not much explored the IBM and the Azure side. I have less experience with uh, Azure and IBM, so I have never used or never dirty my hand with OpenShift. I have heard about OpenShift, but I don't have more idea. But what I guess based on my experience, mm -hmm. it could be something like a rancher. Okay. Or it could be like a vapor top of the Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, still... I have seen uh, with open source, uh, sorry, open ship, they are providing the, you know, some of good capabilities. They have the own CLI tools to connect with the cluster and everything. Mm -hmm. the, I think OC is the CLI tool and I have uh, seen it, but I have not, you know, dirty my hand. So I don't have much idea about that. Okay, sure. So I was like, just wondering because it came, uh, came to me like uh, two, three days back, someone asked and I thought, uh, let's have a discussion about that. So definitely, I uh, will will check that out someday uh, because we like to explore. Okay, so that was about it. Uh, next question is, uh, what do you use to like monitor your Kubernetes? Do you use your like in the cloud platforms only? You also get some insights of the resource usages as, as well. And there is a Kubernetes dashboard that they provide by default. Uh, you just port forward it and you can check. And there are many more tools like Lens ID and all that. So what do you personally use to uh, check the resource usage and all the stuff for managing your cluster? So actually, I'm the fan of CoopCTL, CLI. Okay. I, I use the watch CoopCTL and that's all I use to monitor the things uh, uh, the things running or not. And even metric server is running, we can mm -hmm. run the CoopCTL top. But if you really talk about the monitoring, I use the mostly whatever the cloud provider is, you know, offering. Mm -hmm. uh, if AWS CloudWatch is there, if OKE Oracle is there, then that, 
they have the own monitoring option with the uh, gcp they have the step driver and everything so I, I i prefer those only the default one if anything required a part of that then i you know ship to the prometheus grafana okay. and all those things if uh, tracing is there then move to the jagger side so mostly start using the open source op options prometheus okay. grafana and all those things so yeah and if it's about the application monitoring then uh, uh, apm is good option so you know from um, you know i have used the new relic which is the paid one not open source one uh, sorry uh, not a open source one but uh, yeah uh, i will i prefer apm from a new relic but still they are good uh, you know available others in a market so i have not hands that with apm much but yeah that's all mostly i use for the monitoring application monitoring and all those things right uh, let me one second Yeah. So, and what kind of uh, details do you look for if you are like uh, monitoring only the? Uh, let's talk about the infrastructure part more, uh, not about the application. Then, what do you look for uh, like a daily day-to-day -day basis? Do you look for uh, if your nodes are going out of CPU? If you are like uh, just watching the performance of the cluster, then what do you watch out for? Yeah. So mostly, generally, I you know see the three specific uh, parameter. I I mostly care about the this part um, memory and uh, cpu uh, mm -hmm. side uh, so mostly i monitor the three things but yeah the definitely other uh, you know metrics are important uh, it's not about always this three cause when you have the sli slos and all those things implemented so you might be having the you know a little bit uh, good monitoring across the you know uh, different uh, this metrics and everything but uh, generally on day to day basis uh, if uh, you know any node is going down or something is happening then mostly we we prefer to check around the cpu memory and the disk pressure that is happening on the kubernetes nodes so we just care about three at a very basic level mm -hmm. otherwise if uh, this jvm heap and all those things comes into the picture if you are using the java and everything so the memory leak and uh, it is more of kind of application side but again it also comes on our shoulder yeah. so we have to worry about that yeah at, at the end it's uh, like there was responsibility to keep the things running that's yeah. right okay so now uh, we have two more questions uh, can we do it in this meeting let's check yeah let let's do one question here only and then maybe we'll see. Yeah. okay so the next question is uh, what should an a, a developer uh, should aim for in uh, their career journey like uh, uh, should they aim for like good salary or should they aim for a good company or should they aim for a good designation so what what is the uh, correct uh, attribute to make your dec decision what 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 do you say about it yeah, so actually i i, I would like to uh, re uh, refactor your question a little bit like sure. it's not always about uh, you know skill ideally uh, you know, it's not always about. Uh, actually, it depends on person to person. Mostly. Okay, okay. That is the whole I can answer. If someone is going behind the promotion, then I, I, I you know, cannot uh, suggest them to go behind the skill. Okay. Because sometimes for a person, as uh, designation matter. And mm -hmm. person like me, IC is the best thing. Individual contributor. You give me the IC, and mm -hmm. I will be sitting always into the office and doing the contribution. Okay. Uh, you know, around. If you give me anything, I will work as the IC. I don't want to be the senior, junior, all those things. I so it depends on person to person. If they are looking for the designation or not, I have met one of the good guy on step or floor. He has the 25 years of experience and he been contributing as IC only. And he was kind of uh, lead and mm -hmm. he just you know uh, left the designation and thought I will do the contribution only. Mm -hmm. And the same, I was mentioned about my manager. So he's also doing the same thing. He left that part and just being dicey only. So I have seen people prefer and you know don't uh, go behind the designation. Mm -hmm. If going behind the salary, uh, I think it is necessary mm -hmm. or requirement to survive into this market when the inflation and all those things uh, happening, the collapse of the bank and everything into the mm -hmm. US and all those things. So, a little bit going behind the salary is also necessary, but uh, the salary only comes when your skills are good. Right. Otherwise, you will be a part of layoff uh, sooner or later. 
yeah 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 that definitely layoff is you know one of the worst things even it is not about the if your skills are good i have also seen few people uh, uh, get layoff so mm-hmm. the if whole team is uh, getting laid off then definitely the skills skilled person uh, will, uh, will be there into part of the team yeah. and if you see the google layoff then everyone is skilled person yeah but at least if you are having some skills then you will bounce back easily uh, in compared to yes. other and if if you are like a, a pseudo developer who are just sitting there then after layoff there are like less chances for you to getting the same salary job somewhere else so so i also like think like never be overvalued uh, from your skill so it is uh, it is a safe side if if someone offers me that uh, i can give you this much salary but inside i know that i do not have that much skill set to Uh, match this particular salary i would not opt for uh, uh, being overvalued so yeah that's the uh, yeah I, actually the, definitely that is the part that but uh, you know uh, i would also like to mention a uh, one thing I, if you are joining that uh, specific organization or that specific uh, you know if you mm-hmm. opt for it then it will give you the tremendous amount of uh, confidence if you achieve that because yeah. it will give you the reason to get push so it is more kind of uh, you know uh, upward spiral, spiral. Okay. so generally what happen in a upward spiral mm-hmm. you you know push yourself or you maybe you talk about you know which is beyond your limit but you mm-hmm. start talking about that then what happens now you have the idea i have talked beyond my limits mm-hmm. now definitely i have to achieve it if i want to achieve it then people will you know uh, point a finger at me mm-hmm. so what will happen you always push yourself because you know i have talked beyond my limits okay so you you can so, like uh, uh use this uh, as a or igniter that pushing you yes. from inside so yeah that was yeah so it. yeah so definitely instead of you know people talk about uh, getting the break up and get the igniter and everything instead of i think that this is a good option if you are getting the higher salary then you know i'm you know that much skilled person but i'm getting the salary which is more than my limit mm-hmm. so you will push yourself to do that things and may you will you know achieve it in maybe 3 month 4 month 6 month or everything but definitely you will achieve it and you will have that satisfaction also mm-hmm. at the end so and this is what personally my think is there but again yeah yeah that is a subjective thing person to person but yeah. uh, this point of view was uh, really helpful for me and for all of our viewers right yeah uh, so last uh, maybe we'll do the last question in the next meeting let me thank sure. you okay so we had some great stuff so far uh, i have a last question for harsh so uh, this question is uh, more about how it world is moving forward so as, as today is the uh, like uh, docker has completed 10 years today there is an event also over here in the end of it so like uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier that earlier there were monolithic applications and then we moved to microservices then like docker came up with containerization and once docker came up then we had a new problem that uh, now who will manage the uh, who will scale the docker containers and who will give resources to it and then we developed kubernetes again and then we had another new problem that uh, who will manage this uh, this kubernetes because we have this much complexity so cloud platforms came up with kubernetes services like eks and oke and gcp all those things so are we really making things easier or are we making things complex and where are we headed after like what is after 10 or 15 years what will be the uh, view of how how we will be working in the development and devops stuff what do you, what have you what is your opinion on this yeah so you know answering to this actually it is you know a good good question so mm-hmm. answering this whatever you know i will be speaking mostly my views only so it is mm-hmm. not like uh, something that mm-hmm. so yeah like uh, you know a uh, very good question you asked uh, i recently had the talk with uh, docker mm-hmm. uh, i think uh, she was the she was uh, maybe some manager at docker and mm-hmm. i recently had the uh, you know uh, interaction with her mm-hmm. so you know in docker uh, you might have seen into the market docker caps, uh, captains are there so mm-hmm. i was trying to get my application for the docker captains and everything i was planning out that things and everything so in an interaction we we had now docker is you know not uh, 
planning to hmm. be on a more kind of uh, container side they are more now worried about the security things and everything they are more going into the uh, enterprise side and everything so she mentioned about few things hmm. so I, I i cannot disclose everything but recently if you notice develop uh, docker have uh, you know uh, shared or uh, planned out the default cli which can scan your container mm -hmm. so it is having the option to scan after the your build so if any security scanning is that now it is maybe part of default things but it is into the enterprise version only okay. so they are you know might be focusing on that side now you know company's uh, uh, vision is little bit getting change and all those things uh, also, uh, it's not always about the Docker because Docker is not a only thing that can make the containers or create the images. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, few other options are there uh, to, you know, create the containers and everything. Mm -hmm. While you, you mentioned about this Kubernetes and everything, definitely it is necessary to manage the container, scale up, manage and everything. You might need a team, you might need DevOps engineer to manage the Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. and all those things and it is the cutting edge technology give you the tremendous amount of benefit mm -hmm. the flexibility uh, reliability give you the option to auto heal the things mm -hmm. and so much of things with the kubernetes uh, that burden of managing the kubernetes is always there when you scale to 5000 nodes or 4000 nodes and everything capacity things planning and all those things mm -hmm. now you know what i'm seeing where it will be uh, you know, to solve the Kubernetes issue now, as I mentioned previously, the cloud provider came up with the EKS, the cloud run, mm -hmm. the the GKE autopilot. So you don't have to worry about managing the Kubernetes. Push mm -hmm. your container and forget the things. Mm -hmm. Push your container limit. So you are only focused about your code. You don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You do the limit. My code will need uh, this much amount of CPU and memory mm -hmm. and it will run. Okay. So now the burden of managing the Kubernetes cluster, creating the Kubernetes cluster, cluster the version upgrade and all those things goes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if it is impacting your version, mm -hmm. then you might have to take a little bit into that side. But uh, you know, now you have options, at least alternative. Mm -hmm. You can give your content and it get auto managed, auto scaled also. You don't have to, you know, worry more about the scanning or adding the nodes, mm -hmm. scaling the nodes and everything just worried about your code nothing much okay uh, um, moving further uh, what i guess uh, you know uh, it might could go into the more serverless side mm -hmm. so the serverless functions are already there people are already using it mm -hmm. uh, you know i have seen people are trying and deploying their microservices now onto the serverless side mm -hmm. so serverless container is already the already there serverless function is already there but i guess in few years people also start writing the microservices and fully running their you know applications or things on a, the serverless functions also mostly kind of serverless side not on the serverless functions only because mm -hmm. containers are also now serverless mm -hmm. in a one another way mm -hmm. so if you have the a stateless application then the functions are also now a good options mm -hmm. if you it, it get executed with a uh, you know limitation of uh, uh, that CPU memory that functions provide the time limitation and everything. Mm -hmm. So unless and until you have the requirement of uh, model training with the GPU and all those things, then I don't think the serverless function mm -hmm. will be helpful much. But okay. if you have just a stateless application or the API that responds from the database, then mm -hmm. I don't think why you need the container. You have the function to write the API response. You write your function and do the response. Mm -hmm. So this is what I guess people might be moving ahead with the uh, serverless things. Uh, if AI, the ML ops and everything comes into the picture, then definitely you don't have much options that side. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you might have to stuck with the managing the VMs, which have the you know GPU attached already. So your model get trained with GPU and everything, or you might stuck with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure autopilot from Google. I think it's supporting maybe GPU, but at least GKE, which is okay. the managed Kubernetes service, uh, the same from Oracle. Okay, managed Kubernetes services are providing the GPUs. Okay. So, uh, you know, people might have to stop as of now. 
mm-hmm. that if uh, ml and all those things there otherwise serverless best yeah. option so like i think for the regular developers and application uh, who, who is uh, developing application for them uh, things will be easier but i think uh, the people who are developing the uh, google autopilot itself those developers will uh, need to go in more depth to make things easier for others so yeah uh, heads off to all those people who are uh, working in the cloud platforms like you to make uh, things easier for other developers across the world so thank you very much arsh for being with us on our new episode and we'll see you online in a few weeks thank you sure sure i thank you all for you know uh, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak and uh, share my thoughts idea and you know share my journey across with uh, you know uh, with uh, all the people out there and everything so you know thank you so much for uh, saying and uh, appreciate for your uh, consideration thanks a lot thank you thanks